Howdy ho, BFDers, and welcome to another episode of Brother Friggin' Death. Now that I have a YouTube channel and also a job that has nothing to do with my passion or my degree, I have to spend my free time doing film stuff. That being said, I don't always want to do that. Sometimes I want to sit back and watch an entire film franchise. But then I start feeling bad about not being productive and out of that comes videos like these. I decided that I could do both. Watch movies and make videos about the movies I'm watching. That way I'm relaxing and flexing the film muscle. But enough of that micro rant, let's get into it. Recently, for the very first time, I watched the original Scream movie from 1996. Whoa, Jake, you love film and you've never seen the original Scream movie? Yes, that is correct. And I only watched it for Matthew Lillard because I wanted more of him after watching FNAF, which we did a review on, so go check that out. This video probably should have come out in October since that is spooky month and this is a spooky movie. But uh, Scream is one of my mother's favorite horror films and I figured, hey, why not? I I'm not a horror fan because of one Halloween back in like 2010 uh, when Freddy Krueger scarred me for life. <laughs> but within these past two years, I have opened up and started to invest in them. Really this transformation began during the Al Pacino prison scene podcast days, but last year's film Barbarian truly ignited my interest. I knew that Scream was iconic for its parodization of the slasher subgenre of horror film, and I also knew that slasher was my least favorite subgenre of horror film. I'd also seen Scary Movie, which was making fun of a movie that is making fun of a movie. So is that a parody? Or does it come full circle? Who knows? Regardless, I watched the original Scream and was enthralled. And then I watched the rest of them and made a video for the YouTube gods. I am a bit surprised by how much I have enjoyed this saga. All the movies are worth watching, I'd say, except maybe the lowest on this list, uh, which I'll start right now. Going into this film, I was honestly expecting it to be the worst uh, because of when it came out. Not releasing soon after the original trilogy and not a part of this new wave of Scream movies. Scream 4 was weak in its approach. I felt the motivation and reveal were lackluster and the stakes were non-existent. You know, besides the killing and stuff. This was most definitely an attempt at a reboot, but it hadn't been that long since three. It would be like if Harry Potter was remade today. Those movies came out when I was younger, but I'm not old enough to have kids to show it to yet. So they still exist within my lore. Like, I remember them and they haven't been forgotten by anybody, so why reboot it? Scream 4 wasn't necessary or even wanted. Also, for whatever reason, the film is very soft and the edges bloom all over the place, but it isn't a stylistic choice necessarily, more just how it's filmed. Yes, Sydney is older and has a new life, but she has success based on a book she wrote, but she criticized Gail for doing that in the earlier movies. The idea that the killer is trying to frame Sydney is interesting, but not once did anyone suspect her. Other legacy characters are brought back, but because of the third movie, you either kill them or nothing interesting happens, and guess what? Nothing interesting happens. Gail and Dewey pretty much follow their roles. Jill, a relative of Sydney, and this other guy who likes scary movies, Charlie, are the killers. Two killers, like the original, and they are the killers primarily because they want the fame. I will say that Jill betraying Charlie was cool, but she did it because she wanted the spotlight alone. A family member literally coming out of nowhere just wants to be famous and, and does go about it in a pretty solid way, uh, but ultimately it falls flat because the end of the film where she haphazardly tries to finish the job. There aren't exactly any other noteworthy characters here besides Kirby, but even then she doesn't do a whole lot, but she doesn't let in Charlie when he's locked outside after she starts to dig him. Kudos to her. There are two great things about Scream 4. One is Alison Brie. <laughs> 
And the other is the beginning of the movie. It starts out with a murder, turns out that that's Stab 6, uh, but that is also in a movie, which is Stab 7. And then there is some lame pseudo witty commentary about horror films that try to mimic Randy Meek's spirit, but unceremoniously fails and feels preachy. Especially since the movie then goes on to do what the people were criticizing. At number five, we have the end of the original trilogy, Scream 3. From here on out, I liked all of the films, but three is at the bottom of that list. You can tell the gas is running out in this one because the creatives have used up all their subversions. You can only go so far until you start sounding like Daphne talking to that voodoo guy in the first Scooby-Doo live action film. And you knew I did the opposite of what you said. So you told me not to go to the castle, so I would go up to that castle where you set a trap to capture me. Unless, unless you knew I'd figure it out. So you told me not to go up to the castle, so I would think that you wanted me to go, so I wouldn't go just like you didn't want me to. Huh? Playing off the end of the second film, our first kills are Wolverine's brother Sabretooth and his girlfriend in his nice uptown apartment. Sabretooth and his girlfriend, I'm gonna have to apologize for the glare, my eyes were starting to hurt me. <sighs> Sabretooth has gained notoriety as a result of Scream 2, which I will talk about later, which is exactly what he wanted, and it has become his downfall. Sidney finally tries to escape, living in the countryside as a crisis counselor, which is a fitting response, I think, and displays that Sidney wants to help those afflicted with trauma like hers. Gail and Dewey have been separated. A little cliche, but I accept it. This movie tries not to focus on Sydney as much and tries to give the other stars some time to shine, and I appreciate that. Gale and Dewey have much larger roles here, and Sydney only shows up later in the film. The plot of this film takes place during the production of a stab movie, uh, which is a bit strange in my opinion because it is much less personal to the characters. The only person that has any affiliation with the production is Dewey, who is a technical advisor. This is what I was referring to earlier about running out of gas in the tank. There is real FBI involvement in this one, Agent Kincaid, hold on to that, which I think forces the killer to act a bit more intentionally rather than just killing, like how Stu and Billy did. Oh, did I say killer? I did. There's only one killer in this movie. You've had two movies to solidify a formula and now you can flip it on its head. The killer in this film, Roman, happens to be Sidney's half-brother uh, because it turns out that Sidney's mom is more of a wench than we thought, having multiple extramarital relationships with a lot of different people. During the final moments of the film, you expect there to be another killer, but there isn't. It was tense, but you never get the second reveal. Eventually, the film ends and there isn't one. Roman's motivation is again kind of weak, but at least there is a real connection to Sydney and not some contrived plot happenstance. My biggest criticism of the film is that I don't think it went hard enough. Randy's sister shows the gang a video of Randy talking about how the third movie, uh, the end of a trilogy, insinuates that all bets are off and anything can happen. But anything doesn't happen. The same type of characters exists and the same types of killings happen. The only difference is, as Randy states, the past is rewritten, which did happen, but it only affects who the killer is, not what happens during the duration of the film. There is a massive explosion at some point, which is very cool. The five and six positions, I think, are pretty universal in terms of how other people rate the movies. But the next four are gonna rile some people up. Honestly, this is where things became difficult because the rest of the films all have great things to offer. And I wanna clarify that this is a very, very close call on all fronts. I made this graph to help demonstrate what I mean by, I think I'm gonna pitch scream. Six in position four. This might upset some of you, but hear me out. 
This is the second movie in the Neo Scream trilogy, which theoretically means that it would be playing off of tropes and criticisms of the previous movie. Does it do that? Kinda. But I wasn't thinking about that till just now. What I love about Scream 6 is that we finally, finally get to see some more interesting murder and slaughter. First off, we start out with Samara weaving, falling into the trap that she says is tropey and that you should never do, which is hilarious. Then the killer reveals himself, but it's not the killer. Well, it is, but also not. Then the killer's killer pops up and kills the killer. This is the first true subversion, in my opinion, of Scream's opening sequence. From here on out, the killer is absolutely brutal, not giving a crap where or how they are killing, throwing it all out of the ring and brutalizing anyone in their way. My favorite sequence is in the bodega when Ghostface has a shotgun, it's just blasting everything. Totally different from the norm of a Scream killer. The gore in some of these kills is more intense than in previous installments and this adds to the tone of brutality. I think the continuation of the Billy Loomis daughter plotline was handled in a pretty good way. Picking up from Scream 5, Amber is struggling with not being her father, Billy Loomis. All the while, society is telling her she is. And by the end of the film, we don't know which direction she is going. Only two of these movies scare me. And this is one of them. The filmmaking is on a different level in this one. The suspense of it all, the, the way it's shot, the lighting you sound design and editing come together to genuinely create an atmosphere and experience that is similar to how the characters in the film feel. Maybe this one should be higher on my list. I'll reevaluate next year. Uh, the problems make themselves apparent in the final act of the film where everything gets a little bit messy. The reveal is meh. I don't really care about who the killer is ever, like in any of the movies. And much like Scream since Scream 2, the ghost maze of motivation is a bit lackluster. The family wants revenge, etc. We've seen that already, not to say it's bad motivation, but for a series that was created to criticize slashers and to reuse motivation from a previous installment, Need I say more? The interesting twist about the reveal is that there are three of them. They are revealed pretty quickly, which takes away any sort of the intensity that an audience might have given the two killer rule. There are still some good things about the third act. The only bad thing is really the writing. <laughs> so, uh, but all the film aspects are still there just with less great writing. Beyond all that, Scream 6 is a worthy entry into this video or saga or something. Oh boy, here comes another controversial opinion. Sitting very nicely on the podium with a bronze medal is Scream 2. Not being a part of the horror culture at large or the cult of Scream fans, I don't actually know how people will respond to this ranking. Scream 2 just barely lost out to the top two places. This is a Solid, solid sequel. That is an exemplar of sequels that are necessary. There are some like Shrek 2 where the emotional arc of a character facilitates a second movie. But then there are franchises like Leprechaun that has eight movies for no reason. Sydney's character arc requires a sequel. This is why Scream 4 fails. There wasn't anything to develop. Some would take this argument and use it against Scream 5 and 6, but that's different because it's new characters. The events of Scream left the participants scarred undoubtedly, and as an audience, we are curious about how the events impact their day-to-day -day life. The answer? Randy has a goatee, Sydney has a new boyfriend, Dewey is still a cop but has nerve damage, and Gail? Well, Gail is now super famous. Everyone is trying to live a normal life. I know I would want to live in fear for the rest of my life. This is the typical forget about it trope of this current era, but in 97, it wasn't really. What was once small town murder is now big time murder. Ghostface follows this group around even if he's not really there. Randy, perceptive as ever, notes that they are still in a sequel and that he should get the girl, obviously. 
but Sydney doesn't believe him. Why would she? How could she? After the first murder, Gail runs to the scene and people suspect her of trying to make a Ghostface sequel. Why wouldn't she? How could she? Too bad Debbie Salt is there trying to get the scoop before Gail. Much like the original, Scream 2 plays on audience perception of any given subject and trope. Sydney's past lover was the killer. Would it really be him again? It's always someone in the friend group. Would it really be them again? Maybe, but what about Victor Creed, the character that was in jail for the murder of Sydney's mother, now exonerated from all his crimes because the truth came to light. He also keeps bugging Sydney with seemingly malicious intent, saying that he wants his bit of fame. This makes Sabretooth give off Ghostface vibes. And he has the motivation. All of these twists and turns in my head make this a very intense film to watch. One of the early kills involves the beloved Randy. All of the meta knowledge that the cast has is gone, which means anything goes. The reveal of Ghostface is what I think sells this film. While Sydney is running from Ghostface, she ends up on a stage and out of the floor rises Derek, her boyfriend, hanging on a star or something. And then Ghostface appears and reveals his identity as none other than Mickey. That one guy. Mickey tells Sydney that Derek is the other killer. And the audience is in shock. We can't believe it. Derek says, No, 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 no. To Sydney, but she falters. This has happened to her before. Why wouldn't it happen again? Mickey shoots Derek and calls Sydney a dumb dumb. And out of the shadows. Debbie Salt, that pestering reporter. She is not only the second killer, but also Billy Loomis's mother. There it is. Another play on classic horror tropes. This reveal is the best, second only to the original. Real motivation, real people, real surprises. Or were they? And that's what I love about Scream 2. You never know if they're going to do it again or do it differently. Oh boy, here we go. The top two. I wonder what I'm going to say. The runner-up spot goes to... Scream 5. I saw a few clips about people not liking this one, and I just don't see it. This is a more proper reboot of the series. We've spent time away from the franchise, and now that we're back, we've got a new style, new characters, with legacy characters returning in a logical way instead of just thrust into the plot like some other franchises. After so many meta and repeated openings, Scream 5 finally returns to its classic form. A girl, home alone, is attacked by Ghostface. What I love about Scream 5's intro sequence, this return to form, is that as soon as Tara Carpenter, played by Jenna Ortega, sees Ghostface, she clobbers him right in the face. Tara does end up in the hospital, but she is not dead. Extremely different from all of the other films. However, this does lead our main character, Sam Carpenter, to come out of estrangement to visit Tara. Sam, as we will learn later, and as I have mentioned previously, is the daughter of Billy Loomis. Her mother doesn't really matter except for the fact that she is also Tara's mother. This sets up so many different subtextual themes and motifs. Every character has motivation that is in line with the rest of the film, and their actions reflect that. Richie, who is Sam's current boyfriend, acts as if he has no idea about the Stab movies, when in reality, he is a mega fan. Dewey, who has pretty much lost everything, seeks something to be a part of, which is a pretty common trope with people suffering from trauma in film. Gail's situation is similar, and she wishes to reunite with Dewey. Sydney wants to protect people from Ghostface and stop these attacks from happening to anybody else. And again, Sam wishes to protect Tara, but really, she wants to prove that she isn't a monster like her father. Scream 5 is a second attempt at a reboot and the killers. Richie, in particular, is upset at the direction that the Stab movies are going in and wants to reset the franchise with some new material. He calls what he is trying to do a requel, wanting to retcon the sequels 
which is kind of how I think the Scream franchise looks at Scream 4, which I think for the most part, again, is a bad sequel. The characters in Scream have a tendency to run when in reality, they could just beat the shit out of Ghostface. And again, they do not follow the same path. Dewey is the real hero here. Knowing that he will probably die while they're in the hospital visiting Tara, he goes to confront Ghostface and gets brutally murdered. Scream 2 was pretty ballsy with the killing off of Randy Meeks, but he was a pretty small side character. Dewey, at this point in the saga, is a beloved and staple character of the franchise. Sam Carpenter, I think, is the only Scream character that has the potential to make an appearance as Ghostface in the future, especially with Billy Loomis being her father. And I also think this is a great way to keep that legacy part of the franchise without literally having legacy characters. My biggest gripe with the film, much like all of the films, is the reveal. My initial reaction to Richie and his motivations was poor. I think I literally said bruh out loud. It's pretty weak and honestly, what a lame reason to kill people. I did say that it works and it does with the meta commentary of the film. That being said, it's still kind of lame. But overall, Scream 5 is an awesome film that is absolutely worth suffering through Scream 4 to get to. Here we are at the number one spot. Why are we doing this? We know what number one is. If not for the film itself, then by deductive reasoning, Scream 1 takes the top spot. The film that started the franchise while simultaneously revolutionizing the slasher genre. In 1996, several other slashers like Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, Child's Play, and Sleepaway Camp, the genre was desperate for a shakeup and Scream brought the thunder. This film genuinely frightened me with one scene in particular, which is not something I can say for most of the installments. Generally, slashers start off with the kill. Scream does this but the killer ghost face has much more of a presence and actual sentience than the killers of other franchises. Jason's mom is sort of a specter in her movie. Michael Myers, although more present, is definitely more of a force, but Ghostface wants his victims to see him, to suffer. Death is not what Ghostface seeks, it's pain. That's why he calls his victims and instills fear in them before murdering them brutally. The other amazing aspect of this film is the fact that the characters are aware that they are in a horror film. Well, some of them, like Randy Meeks. So many times when I've been watching slashers, I've been sitting there screaming at the TV, yelling, just turn around, and Scream knows that. It dribbles in moments where the characters are aware of the typical slasher tropes, like saying, I'll be right back. Oh. I think the awareness heightens the moments when the characters are unaware. Like when Randy is saying, look behind you and Ghostface is right behind him. There are rules, as Randy describes, and mainly he's talking about killer victims. Don't do drugs, don't have sex, basically don't do anything deviant. Ironically, the killers after our main character, Sidney Prescott, who avoids all of these things. The year that this is set in is the first anniversary of her mother's death, and she believes it was a man by the name of Victor Creed. If you remember him, the rest of the friend group, which she really isn't a part of, does partake in more of this deviant behavior, but not really. Billy Loomis and Stu Mocker, the ghost-faced killers, are probably the most deviant and really the only ones. And they are the killers, so it doesn't count for them. Gail Weathers, a spiffy little journalist, is the one who tries to turn the tables on Sydney, accusing her for condemning an innocent man. Dewey, one of Sydney's friend's brother, is an up-and-coming naive policeman who is bent on solving the case. He arrests Billy after the first attack because of a dropped cell phone, and we are led to believe that he is innocent, even though Billy is in fact the killer. But because there are two killers, we are thrown off. Scream 96 is absolutely subversive in pretty much every way and changed how slasher films are viewed. It threw out all the tropes or used them to trip us up. Scream 96 has the most unsettling scenes I have ever witnessed. And I might be strange for this, but during the final confrontation with Billy and Stuart discussing their plan, they state that in order for it to look real, they need to be injured. 
This leads to Billy stabbing Stu several times, leaving Stu extremely bloody and weak. Something about Stu's voice here gives me the heebie-jeebies. I don't know what it is, but I walked away from that sequence particularly unsettled in a very unique way. Scream isn't the scariest movie out there, but it should, beyond a shadow of a doubt, be in every horror fan's, and even film fan's, catalog of greatest films ever made. Phew! That was a long one, fellas, but I tell you, I am very glad that I had this experience. Like I said earlier, I don't know how everyone else feels about these movies, so let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear your opinions about these films and let me know how you feel about my ranking and share your ranking as well. If you like this format of franchise reviews, rankings, then let us know and we can get more of these out for you guys. I haven't talked to Kyle about this, but we have like a pseudo merch store set up. Uh, so go check that out, link in the description. We got shirts, stickers, hats, tote bags, all sorts of stuff. Uh, right now, it's just our logo variations, but if you'd like to see more designs, let us know. We want to do this full time for you guys uh, and to put our film degrees to use, of course. So make sure you give that like button a little kiss and subscribe so you can get notified on all our uploads. All that being said, I enjoyed the Scream movies, and if you haven't watched them, give them a shot. And if you have, watch them again with my ranking in mind to see how you feel about them. Okay. I've talked long enough about this, so I'm gonna end the video now. But I will see you in the next one. Ah!